Hello and welcome to Live at State, the State Department's interactive virtual press briefing platform. I'm delighted to welcome everyone joining us today from across Europe and around the globe. Today we'll be speaking with Elliot Abrams, U.S. Special Representative for Venezuela. Before I turn it over to represent Special Representative Abrams for some opening remarks, I would like to make a few comments on procedures for questions. You can start submitting your questions now in the Questions tab at the top of your screen. If you see someone else ask a question that you'd also like us to answer, you can upvote it by clicking the Like button to the right of that question. We will try to answer as many as we can, but our time is limited, so please vote to indicate the questions you'd most like us to cover. If you would like to receive a transcript of today's briefing and links to broadcast quality audio and video files, please fill out the short survey by clicking on the Polls tab at the top of the event page. With that, let's get started. Special Representative Abrams, thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to you for some opening <clears throat> remarks. <clears throat> thank you. Do I get to vote on the questions? No. Unfortunately, no. That's no, just okay. for our participants. All right. uh, very briefly, uh, I would just say I met yesterday with Fabiano Rosales, Juan Guaido's wife. Um, as you know, she met the vice president uh, and the president yesterday, uh, and uh, they all made some remarks at the White House, but it was a, a valuable and very interesting meeting. Um, secondly, I would just comment on the um, continuing blackouts in Venezuela. Uh, Twenty years of lack of maintenance, lack of investment <clears throat> have produced a terrible situation for the people of Venezuela where we're now into the second week, soon into the third week of these continuing blackouts. And it's a symbol of the mismanagement that the Maduro regime is responsible for. Great. Well, we'll get started with our uh, first question, which comes from Eleni Panayotu from Journalists About Journalism in Greece. Eleni asks, what can be done to counterbalance the ongoing Russian disinformation campaign built around the Trojan horse narrative that tries to portray U.S. humanitarian aid as malign interference? Well, I think that campaign uh, really discredits itself. It's so completely ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> the United States provided some aid, and we have had journalists all over those warehouses. Um, we have said that we would be happy to work with the Catholic Church in Venezuela. Anyone who wants to inspect the aid can do so. This really is disinformation, uh, and I think most uh, journalists who are covering it know that. Uh, the U.S. military planes were used because we wanted to try to get as much aid down there as quickly as possible. But um, we are completely open about what we are bringing, and any kind of legitimate inspection regime would be uh, perfectly welcomed. Next question comes from Nicolas Bercier from Le Monde in France. Can you explain why, in the middle of this deep crisis with a lack of food, electricity, and medicines, the Venezuelan army is still behind Maduro's regime. Uh, well, it is troubling. I think part of it is fear. Uh, there are several thousand Cuban intelligence officers permeating the, both the civilian and the military intelligence agencies in Caracas, the DGCIM and the SEBIM. Um, and their, one of their key goals is uh, precisely to make sure that no one in the military who asks that same question why are we still supporting Maduro, gets away with it and is not immediately apprehended and punished. So uh, the fear is part of it. Um, I think at the high levels, you know, there are a couple of thousand generals. They are still benefiting from participation in the regime. Um, but I think uh, we have some evidence that this, um, this is being thought about a lot at the, um, in the military. Because if you're in the military, you know, you have a brother and a sister. You have aunts and uncles and cousins. You know how they are suffering. Um, so I think there are conversations going on, um, happily, conversations that are not visible. Um, and I do believe that um, in the end, the Venezuelan military will act uh, on behalf of the Venezuelan people. Next question comes from Ana Pisanero at Europa Press. Did the U.S. make an error of judgment not anticipating Maduro's ability to hold on to power? And would the U.S. accept early presidential and parliamentary elections? Well, we, we um, certainly want um, elections, uh, presidential, parliamentary, on a timetable that 
you know, that Venezuelans will consider to be um, proper. Um, the election, the presidential election of last May, May 2018, was a farce, and international observers all said so. So they need a presidential election because under their constitution, the presidency is vacant. That's why they have to have an interim president, um, Juan Guaido. I don't think we made um, any mistakes here. Um, we are supporting the, Venez the Venezuelan people in their desire to get rid of the Maduro regime and return Venezuela to democracy. No one has a timetable for this. It would be better if it happened this afternoon, but no one can predict exactly when Maduro uh, will be gone. Um, and the United States had no timetable. We are supporting the Venezuelan people. We're supporting interim President Guaido for as long as it takes. Turning now to our question with the most votes as of right <laughs> now, which is from Vladimir Yermakov at the Interfax News Agency in Russia. Are you still in contact with Russia on the issue of the presence of Russian troops in Venezuela? And are those contacts constructive? Uh, I was uh, recently in Rome where I met with the Deputy Foreign Minister Rybkov. Um, uh, this was prior to those flights, but um, where we had, I thought, a useful conversation about Venezuela. And this past weekend, Sunday, I think, um, Secretary Pompeo spoke with Foreign Minister Lavrov specifically about those flights. You know, we were in contact with uh, Russia pretty regularly about a wide range of issues. We certainly think that uh, those flights and Russia's role um, are very uh, unconstructive uh, for any solution to what's happening in Venezuela. Next question comes from Rosalind Jordan at Al Jazeera English Television. The U.S. has recognized Guaido as president. Are you prepared to talk directly with Maduro about his political future? Are you empowered by President Trump to engage Maduro? And if so, what incentives can you offer to induce, induce Maduro to leave office? Secretary Pompeo testified yesterday in Congress and said what has been our policy very clearly. Um, there's no evidence at all that negotiating with Maduro does any good. There have been previous negotiations with him involving uh, the Venezuelan opposition in previous years. He simply uses them to kill time and try to divide the opposition. The only thing to negotiate with Maduro about is what are the terms of your departure? Venezuelans have many, many things to talk about and negotiate about, um, but not with Maduro because he has, he has already shown who he is and what he is doing to the country. Next question from Ricardo Jorge Pinto from the Portuguese News Agency. How do you think European countries should react now that Guaido failed in the 30-day deadline to ensure free elections? Uh, Guaido has not failed. Guaido has provided and is providing and will provide um, leadership for returning Venezuela to democracy that it has actually not had. That is, in the past, people have said, well, the opposition is so divided. Now, the opposition came together. They chose the president of the National Assembly, Juan Guaido, under Venezuela's constitution. He is legitimately the interim president. So I reject the notion that uh, the National Assembly has failed or that Guaido has failed. Uh, he is continuing his efforts. The National Assembly is continuing their efforts. And we and 53 other countries in the world uh, regard him as the legitimate president of Venezuela, and we will continue to support him. Next question from uh, Beatriz Pascual Macias from EFE. Uh, Juan Guaido has asked the European Union for more sanctions on top officials from the Maduro government, uh, specifically to target their financial assets. Is that something that the U.S. government agrees with? Uh, has the U.S. asked the EU to impose those kinds of sanctions? We do agree with it, certainly, and we're doing it. That is, we in the United States are doing it, and we've frozen accounts all over the world. We've uh, talked to governments and banks all over the world. And there needs to be more of this, because the money in those accounts was stolen from the people of Venezuela. Um, so I, I, we have asked um, governments in Europe and other places 
um, to review uh, this question and to impose more sanctions. In some cases, uh, to look also at visas for um, representatives of the Maduro regime. Uh, and I hope that more governments will actually pursue that line of activity. Next question from Dorian Jones at Voice of America. Will Turkey face any consequences if it continues with its support to President Maduro through gold processing and other measures? And what would those consequences be? Well, I think it is fair to say that Turkey is <clears throat> strongly supporting the Maduro regime. Um, and we have asked a number of countries, whenever we see the movement of assets out of Venezuela, assets that belong to the people of Venezuela, anywhere, whether it's, um, whether it's gold or anything else of value, um, we inquire and we ask the governments in question to stop it, even though often these are private transactions with a private party in that f uh, foreign country. Um, and we have not had the cooperation from Turkey that we want. So what happens? Well, I think one thing that, that people in Turkey should realize is that Venezuela is going to be free. Venezuela is going to be a democracy. And Venezuelans are then going to ask themselves who helped and who didn't help. So Turkey is undermining its own position, not only in Venezuela, but all of Latin America. Because Latins are looking at this. Most of the major countries of Latin America have also said, we support Juan Guaido and we support the people of Venezuela in their struggle to return to democracy. They will also look at this. They are looking at it now. I think that's a cost for Turkey. As to what the United States will do in terms of our bilateral relationship, that's something that I, I, I think we'll, you know, we'll leave for bilateral talks. Next question from Guido Lafranchi at Diplomat Magazine in the Netherlands. As the U.S. sanctions deprive the Venezuelan government of its revenues, the effect of those sanctions will also be felt by the population. How can the U.S. ensure that sanctions do not harm the Venezuelan people? First, um, you know, U.S. sanctions started to be imposed less than two months ago, um, about two months ago, but in, in some cases with a 90-day grace period, so they haven't even taken effect yet. We had nothing to do with the million percent inflation in Venezuela last year. We had nothing to do with the fact that by the turn of the year, several months ago now, three out of five Venezuelan hospitals were uh, closed. We had nothing to do with the continuing blackouts that are just causing devastation for the people of Venezuela. We had nothing to do with the return of communicable diseases that had been eliminated in Venezuela. So the notion that the United States is responsible for any of this, I think, is completely contradicted by the evidence. Going forward, what are we trying to do? We are trying to move humanitarian aid into Venezuela. Why are the tons and tons and tons of aid that we ship down there sitting in Cucuta, Colombia, rather than going into Venezuela? And there would be much more, because many other countries are willing to help. There's one reason. The Maduro regime blocks it. I would hope that as the situation internally gets worse, and if you, if you look at the uh, electrical blackouts, it will get worse. Uh, the Maduro regime, even, will realize that a foreign humanitarian assistance is really needed by the people of Venezuela. Now, I would just add about that, that this regime has used humanitarian aid as a weapon. They have weaponized it. They have politicized it. They have given it specifically to supporters of the regime and denied it to people who are not supporters of the regime. Now, we're not going to play that game. We are certainly not going to participate in a scheme where American assistance and other foreign assistance goes to the regime, which then distributes it, not on the basis of need, but on the basis of political support. But humanitarian assistance that goes to those in need, that's what the United States is trying to do. Next question from Gregorio Garcia at La Razón in Spain. What countries, apart from Spain, could host Venezuelan government politicians during a transition? Well, I think um, there are two questions here. I, I wonder if he means could host somebody like Maduro <clears throat> when he leaves. There are a number of countries that I think could do that. Um, 
I don't know whether anybody needs to do that. If, if what, what is meant, I'm sorry, but if what is meant is host negotiations, um, in most cases in Latin America that I can think of, the negotiations have been held in the capital city. They have not needed to be held, <clears throat> excuse me, overseas. Um, uh, Spain could certainly be helpful here. Um, the church in Venezuela could be helpful here. But I'm inclined to think that uh, transition talks are more likely to be held in Venezuela, perhaps with the help of um, mediators or facilitators. But usually, as I think back to decades of Latin transitions to democracy, the people of the country are talking directly to each other inside the country. Next question from Simon Schuster at Time Magazine. What is your assessment of the Russian strategy in Venezuela and the size of the forces and assets that it has de deployed to achieve that strategy? Well, I think the Russian strategy is to support this regime. They are completely unconcerned by the degree of repression that the regime um, is using, and that degree is growing without any apparent uh, objection from the Russians. Uh, they want a regime in place that looks to Cuba and Russia, rather than looking to its neighbors in Latin America, which have rejected it, um, or looking to the uh, United States or the other democracies that have already recognized Juan Guaido as legitimate interim president. Um, so I think one other thing the Russians are trying to do, I would add, they think they are trying to protect the money that they're owed uh, by Venezuela one of the uh, uh, arguments I made to Deputy Foreign Minister Ribkov was, you'll never get your money back from Maduro because his regime, his economic policies are destroying the economy of Venezuela. Only with prosperity um, could your loans or investments be paid back. Um, but the Russian role, um, which we now see includes the uh, landing of military planes uh, and some military presence, um, does absolutely nothing for the people of Venezuela. It is not just a net negative, it is completely negative. Next question from Jennifer Hansler at CNN. What more is the U.S. willing to do to compel the release of Roberto Morero? Is there concern that Maduro will immediately move to arrest Guaido? Uh, you know, people in the regime have, over the past month or two, <clears throat> threatened uh, President Guaido threatened to arrest him. And I would say that's a concern of the United States and of uh, every, obviously, of the other 53 countries that have recognized him as interim president. The arrest of his advisor, his chef de cabinet, uh, Roberto Marrero, um, may be a test by the regime of how far they can go. And by the way, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just an arrest. Uh, you may have seen the pictures, many of the journalists will, of the way they deliberately just wrecked his house uh, in doing that, needlessly. Um, so it's a very bad sign of increasing repression on the part of the regime. Um, we have uh, developed some options for what the United States will do. Um, we uh, will make it clear to the, uh, those options will make it clear to the regime um, the price they're paying. I think that they recognize they will pay an enormous price um, for doing anything to interim President Guaido, not just uh, diplomatically, but internally from the Venezuelan people. So we certainly hope that they don't um, go down that path. And I think our last question will come from Lindsay Hilsom at Channel 4 News in the UK. Is military intervention possible, and if so, by whom? <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, we don't have much more to say about that than what the president has said. The president always says, indeed he said yesterday, um, all options are on the table. Why does he say that? He says it because it's true. All options always are on the table. This is not the path the United States is choosing right now. The path we are choosing is economic, political, diplomatic, financial pressure on the regime, support for the people of Venezuela, uh, and interim president uh, Guaido. Uh, but uh, those options exist, um, as the president uh, reminds us. 
Well, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. So thank you again to our participants for your questions, and thank you, Special Representative Abrams, for joining us. You're welcome. To those who participated in today's conference, if you would like to clip audio or video from today's program, we will send you links to broadcast quality files momentarily. We will also provide a transcript as soon as it is available. If you would like to receive any of these products, please remember to fill out the survey located in the Polls tab at the top of the event page. Thanks again for your participation, and we hope you can join us for another briefing again soon.